All right, so I'm from California. I'm at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in sunny Pasadena. Came uh, like three, three hours in the past, so I'm a little jet lagged. But uh, thanks for staying here. Um, today I'm gonna really talk about sort of how we've really leveraged commercial technologies in our lab to advance research in the operations of the neat deep space robotics that we have out there. So things like the Curiosity rover, things like the spaceships around Saturn, Jupiter, um, trying to combine those in a more effective and innovative way. Starting from things like the Connect all the way up to things like the Microsoft HoloLens, which just was announced a couple months ago. A little bit of background, I work in the Ops Lab. This is basically a conglomerate of designers, developers, artists who are keen on making things work more effectively. So things like these guys, um, robots that are roaming, robots that are flying, we got um, satellites, things that are on Mars, things that haven't really been into space yet, but things we wanna take to asteroids, to Mars and the moon and beyond. And while this is an awesome opportunity for us, it's really exciting to work on these projects, it's also a huge challenge, right? Because these robots are so complex and so different. So we have to come up with innovative ways to control them. And one of the first industries we looked to was the gaming industry, of course, right? Because we're thinking, you know, if you've got people who can pick up a really complex game like World of Warcraft in just a few minutes, then why can't we leverage some of those skills to have our rover drivers or our science planners control spacecraft that effectively and so we've uh, we've talked to a lot of companies out there we started with this one which is the Xbox Connect which came out four years ago four or five years ago and when it came out it was really exciting right because it was a, a device that captured not only color data but depth data and it compressed it all down into a USB uh, interface that anyone could hack on and of course for us we started right away to hack on it. We didn't really know what we were doing back then, so we tried a lot of different things, like people here, and I, I strongly recommend that when you have a new technology, you try a lot of different things. Things like manipulating virtual objects uh, with our hands, with a stereoscopic 3D. Uh, what if you could hold an object and move it around by tracking you? And then we sort of extended this idea to say, hey, what if you could work and collaborate with other people in the same environment? What if you had a tablet user who could look at a model at the same time you could manipulate it with your hands? So in, you know, think about this in a mission operation, mission control, mission planning world where you can modify a 3D model in real time and other people can see it being affected. This is also the beginning of when we started to look at fusing multiple data sources on Mars to create some of the best Mars terrains out there. And we'll see this work develop over the course of our experience there. This is some work with the Robonaut 2, which is a humanoid robot on the space station. And we were able to map our body to it and actually control it with our body. Uh, pretty neat ideas out of here. But really just kind of sparse, trying to just spray and pray, trying to see what kind of ideas might hit. And actually what happened out of this is we started a really fruitful collaboration with Microsoft. And the one idea that came out of it was we should build a game. And not just any game, we were gonna build a Mars rover landing game right before the landing of the Curiosity rover. And this was a unique opportunity because it was actually NASA's first console game. And it was released for free, of course, around the same time of the landing. A really exciting way to share not only the landing experience, but sort of educate the public a little bit about how complex it was to, to do this crazy task of landing a, a spacecraft on a different planet. So in this game, you got to go through three different phases of entering the atmosphere, uh, firing off rocket boosters to, to, to shoot off parachutes and break out the heat shield, and then of course, safely land on the surface of Mars. Very exciting opportunity for us, well received in the public and within our, our own agency. And that was the really the beginning of a long-term relationship, well, which, I'll come by, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Shortly after this, we found out about another technology out there 
called the Leap Motion. Now this was another input device, which was really neat, very easy to hack. And this one capitalized on capturing your hand gestures, right? Uh, it could recognize your, your fingers, and it was able to give you much higher fidelity mapping to your hands than the Kinect was able to do. And so we were thinking, well, hey, what could we do to hack on this thing? And one idea clearly came to mind. And it was centered around this robot. This is a robot called Athlete, and we have it at JPL. It's a real robot. It's two stories tall, one ton, six legs. Each leg has six degrees of freedom, six joints. And we want to send it into space to help build habitats for astronauts. So it's a complicated robot. You can imagine a nightmare to operate. So we started thinking about ideas of how to do that, right? Using the Kinect, using this Z-Space device, basically a 3D stereoscopic display with a stylus for fine manipulation. And then moving on, of course, to mapping it to our hands directly using a leap. And then we took it a step further. We mapped it directly to the actual robot in our labs. And with our hands, we were able to fly it around. We displayed this at GDC a couple years ago on stage. And it was a really exciting but really scary moment as I hovered my hand over this leap device and moved this giant robot you know, hundreds of miles away. Let's see. It's called Athlete, yeah. All terrain, hex limbed, extraterrestrial explorer. There you go. So it was back then we were exploring a lot of input devices and through that of course we looked at app ways of more, with, with ways of better immersing the, the operator, right? Using stereoscopic 3D to just try to give them a better understanding of the environment. But we wanted to do more. We want to explore more on the output side of things. And it was around that time, a couple years ago, that this device came out, the Oculus Rift. Again, a super neat gadget that was super hackable and a great opportunity for us to explore a new side of operations, right? What if you could immerse the operator, the scientists or engineers on a place that they were familiar with, like Mars? So again, we took the hacking and we built a couple different prototypes. The first one you see here is basically a, a panorama viewer, left right eye stereo, and we built a space station fly around. You can fly around on the inside and the outside of, of a space station, get you a little understanding of it. Then we took the Omni treadmill device and allowed you to literally walk on Mars. Here again, you're seeing another iteration of our terrain fusion technology, getting a little bit better over time. This is mostly just high resolution imagery from the satellites. But you get a nice kind of progression as we're getting better terrain, as we're getting better input, and we're fusing output with input. At this point, we're, we're thinking that we might really have something, right? And, but, but of course, at JPL, as a scientific institution, we had to prove that we had value. And to do that, we had to do something extra special. And that was to perform an experiment. And to perform that experiment, we had, the technology back in time didn't have what we needed, so we built our own. We took the rotational aspect of uh, uh, the data from the Oculus, merged it with positional data that we built from the Bicon tracking volume, a mocap system. And we put the user on Mars and tracked them in this 3D volume. And then we created an even more impressive piece of terrain using both a collection of 2D and 3D data. So they were standing literally on a real site on Mars with the rover. And what's neat is that, you know, when we're looking at images of Mars right now, all the images are from the perspective of the rover, right? They're taken from the cameras on the rover. And really for the first time here, you can walk around from different angles on Mars at perspectives that no one has ever seen. And so that's just a quick prototype, of course but we wanted to do a study. So we took 17 of the best Mars scientists out there operating on uh, opportunity and curiosity, and we told them to map out an area on Mars, both in their current mission tool, which is a 2D interface that we also built, and in this prototype, right? So we picked out five rocks for them and said, hey, where do you think they're located relative to each other? 
And the results were, were really surprising to us because we found that they were able to discern distances and angles far better in this immersive experience than their mission tool, than their current mission tool. So they're making errors in their judgment of the understanding of Mars as they're doing this. And they're doing this every day, right? And then they get together, tens and hundreds of these guys get together with different mindsets, with different errors, and they try to plan on Mars. So you can imagine a, a lot of time is wasted just on correcting their kind of understanding of the morphology or space that they're on. So really neat data came out of this. And around the same time, we got in touch with Microsoft again, and we heard about this device, uh, HoloLens, of course. We saw this a couple years ago because we were close with our friends starting working in the Connect. And a year ago, it was at a point where they reached out and said, hey, I think we have something ready for you guys. What do you think you could do with it if we gave this to you? And you know, this is right after we did this experiment with the, with the Oculus, and we said, oh my god, we have to take scientists to Mars. We have to bring Mars to their office so that they can walk around just like they would do if they were a geologist on Earth. And so that's what we did. We took five people from our team and we sent them to Redmond and lived with the, the Microsoft people for two months and we built a prototype. The prototype was called OnSite. It was so successful that we proved this through all the upper ranks of Microsoft and all the ranks in NASA. And we are gonna deploy this into operations in just a couple of months. So let me show you a video real quick. Hopefully this will work. And this should speak for itself about what this product will do for you. OnSite is a tool we're building in collaboration with Microsoft to connect scientists and engineers with the environment of the Curiosity Mars rover. Since we can't put our scientists yet physically on Mars, a technology like this allows us to investigate well, what's possible if we can make them virtually present. This was the first time where I could basically do a 360 and see Mars all around me. I love the fact that people, when they first encounter this project, have a feeling of, wow, you know, I've lived to see this. Instead of looking at 2D images, they can now walk around and explore Mars in their office. It was part inspiring, part just like, wow, I can finally do this thing that I really want to do. I could see using this every single day. It is a different way of exploring. That's transformational. Our plan is to deploy on-site to mission operations this summer and to be controlling rovers on Mars with this technology in July. It's funny, that guy in that video, Fred Callip, he is what we call the keeper of the maps. So he's in charge of building the best representation of the understanding of Mars that anyone knows. And when we showed them this, he just went nuts. You know, he started crawling on the floor, looking at rocks from different at angles, Nobody ever expected that from him. But um, really exciting to, to see that the scientists or engineers on all sides are very engaged about this. And I mean, you can see sort of a progression of, of how we explore these technologies. We, we find them, we embrace them, we explore the opportunities, and we narrow it in on a couple of ideas of that, that we try to you know, polish up. And you can see we came from early days of Connect and really hacking together ideas to a place where we're at now where we're actually gonna use this on a real mission. So I, mean, I have another couple of stories to share, but I think I'll just wrap up around here. The, the reason why we're all here today is because you know, we're excited about two things, right? Space and technology. And the intersection of those two things is sort of where we wanna be. And that's what we've always pushed on this mission. The idea that two separate groups, two companies could come together 
and, and all get along and agree that space is great and technology is great and holograms are great um, was sort of a, a huge advancement. Because at NASA, we're, we're excited to be on the forefront of technology. You know, in all these talks, we're talking about how, how NASA's pushing the barrier of the future. But on the, on the flip side, you're hearing about a lot of, a lot of things about you know, the iPads on the space station, right? But the iPads come out six, seven years ago. And really, for the first time, we wanted to be on the bleeding edge. We wanted to have the HoloLens. We wanted to build with the device. We wanted to deploy with this before anyone even knew it existed. And I think we were uh, able to accomplish that. So in the spirit of Hackathon, um, very happy to be here to tell you about technology. Hope you got a little bit of understanding about how we came to really embrace commercial industry and all the technologies out there. And, and at the heart of it, we're just hackers like you guys. So thanks for having me, and uh, I'll be around. Any uh, quick questions for, uh, for Victor? So most of the devices you guys have been hacking on come from the private sector. Do you find that uh, those devices are accurate enough for something like flight controls or something like that? Or is it just completely out of the realm of that you would use like a, a, a private sector device for something like that? Or does that question make sense? Yeah, you know, it's funny because when we talk about uh, controlling these robots and I'm talking about how hard it is to control some of these robots, it's not just that they're, they're hard to control as in like joysticking, but some of these robots are millions of miles, hundreds of millions of miles away. Right? So you've got the time delay problem, you've got communication problems, and um, yeah, so we're not joysticking some of these things. And you think about the Mars mission, right? We've got pretty much a 24 hour planning cycle. We've got, uh, we get data back in the, uh, at the beginning of the day. Then when scientists look at the data and try to understand where they are, uh, they try to understand what they can do next. Then they have to negotiate with each other, uh, like I mentioned before, about what their right understanding is, agree on the top few priorities, and then negotiate with the engineering team to see what's feasible here, how much power do we have, can we really do this during the day? And then, um, you know, they get into the sequence of like writing out the code that actually talks to the robot. So, you know, that's a roundabout way of saying on, on the on-site mission, we're actually just enabling, the, our top priority is enabling our scientists, engineers, and eventually, of course, the general public to have a better understanding of just where they are. And that is, you know, ha more than half the battle right now. Other questions? Thank you. Um, the last product that you mentioned, would it, would it be available in, in retail, and how much would it go for? Yeah, the, I, I think the HoloLens is expecting to go to release to the public soon. Um, the next big announcement they'll, they'll probably talk about is at the build conference in a couple weeks. I don't think they said anything about availability, except that it's going to come in the Windows 10 time frame. So, but it's going to be a real product, which is really exciting for us. Obviously for us, we we want it to be a real product because then we can buy hundreds of them for all of our scientists. And our goal is, of course, if this works well, we want every single scientist on the mission to have one. Because why not? Sure. Uh, can you talk about, share some of the most surprising discoveries that um, have been made from putting this technology in the hands of scientists? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of good stories. I'll give you one. There's a place called Dingo Gap. If you guys follow Mars missions, it's a, it's a tiny little hill on Mars. The scientists, when we got to that hill, deliberated about whether we could go over that, that tiny hill for, I think, a week. And that's expensive, right? And we, we then, of course, took these same scientists through our on-site demo. And the first thing they said was like, oh my god, if I had this for like five seconds, we would have saved, you know, days of time. So things like that, you know, just being able to look at it for different perspectives is immensely valuable. You know, like just me walking around on it and being able to walk around the office and run around these hills is just incredible. It's like being in space, almost there. You know, uh, yeah. Thanks. 
So when we compare uh, virtual reality like the Oculus versus augmented reality like the HoloLens, mm -hmm. people will usually associate like full immersiveness with virtual reality. What what made it more, I would say, more realistic or more useful to actually go with a an augmented reality approach like the HoloLens? What was the big differentiator here? The big differentiator here is that we were actually using, leveraging the mixed reality capabilities of the device. So one thing we, we didn't want to do and what we learned from actually doing that test with our scientists was that VR is actually really intimidating because you put that in front of a scientist and you think these are not technologies, they're not hackers, they're not gamers. It's scary, right? Like suddenly everything goes away and you don't know where you are. And if we're telling them, hey, go walk around on Mars in their office, it's really intimidating. So actually what we have here is not only is it mixed reality so it doesn't cover your entire vision, but we have the capability of cutting out their desk. And so if you, if you see some of these videos and if you walk through the experience, it's actually really magical because you see all of Mars around you in your office, you see your office, and you see a cutout of your monitor and your desk. So they can still use their, their current mission tools on their computer and be on Mars, and then they can take their mouse and move it off their screen into the virtual world. So it's kind of like a mix of all these worlds, which is just not capable with, with, with VR. And for us, you know, VR, AR, MR, it's all good, right? We don't, we don't pick and choose. We, we pick the right device for the right application. And as you see in all of these videos, we really try to narrow in on what's the right thing to do. Do all these devices have open APIs or do you have to reverse engineer some of this stuff? Um, I mean, for most of these guys, we were, we were so close with them that we're, we're in that the, the entry level. But I'd say all these have open APIs. I mean, like Leap has APIs, Connect, Oculus, and at Build Conference, I'm sure they're gonna talk a lot more about. Same level of API that you guys get to use at Ops Lab. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Nothing secret, it's just we got to work with them a little bit before everyone else did. So it seems that uh, the sequence of events is that uh, Microsoft develops the hardware and then they introduce it to you and then you develop the application. Yeah. What if you could reverse the process? What would you, uh, which, which, what would you ask Microsoft to do it? You know, that, that's, we think about that a lot actually. It's what's the next step, right? Like we got to a point where we were ahead of the hardware release that we can make influential decisions in their roadmap. What, what would be really exciting for us next is to be able to influence the decision making of the hardware. So not only from the commercial side of things, but imagine if on the next Mars mission or the next Jupiter Europa mission that we could tell them, hey, if you put this sensor package on board, we would be able to give you this much more data back, right? If you just had this onboard processing power, we could build a complete map of the site drive before even getting it back to Earth. So I, I, I think it's really exciting to think about what's possible in terms of just moving up um, our influence level. And I think part of it is just proving that we can do this, right? The more we prove ourselves, the more they trust us, the more we have control over the, the, uh, the initial steps of the development of the device. Yeah, actually just following that up, uh, I was just curious, it seems like your limiting factor is the cameras on the rover itself. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know there's many of them, but I was just curious if you could say a few words about Absolutely. what that's like. Yeah, um, so this, this deserves a talk in itself. And my colleague Alex Menzies, he's, he's, he's brilliant. Basically what we've done, it was we've created in this on-site video that you saw, all of that terrain data is real. Um, it's not CG. And how we were able to do that is we're combining the depth data from the, our nav cams. So we get a 3D stereo correlated um, point cloud data from the depth, uh, from the navigation cameras on the rover. We stitch that with high resolution mass cam data. So that's a, another camera that takes high resolution images. We stitch that together. The problem in the past that have tr uh, kind of plagued us is that when you do this, you have holes in the back of rocks, right? Because you can only see sort of where you are from the rover. And we've solved that problem by two things. One is we're fusing data from the high res 
the high-rise camera from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. So we were fusing satellite data with the rover data, and then we're fusing that with multiple sites that the rover has been. So because we have the calibration data from all of the cameras, from all of these uh, cameras on the, uh, the rover and the spacecraft, we can stitch that all together. So multiple side drives, multiple camera views, and even stitching in the satellite data to create some of the best looking terrain that's ever made. And then doing that all autonomously within an hour. So that's our goal. Basically by June, uh, July, uh, for our team, new data comes in the pipeline from the spacecraft. We ping it, we get that, we, we, we receive that data, we build that entire new terrain data set within an hour so that the scientists can walk in there and make smart decisions that day about where to target science uh, on Mars. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's thank Victor. Thanks, I'll be around if you guys wanna talk more. <laughs> <laughs>